Coffee Pod here on Four Lads Had a Dream. My name's Andrew, and I'm joined tonight by three of my very favourite podders. First of all, Kenny, how you doing, mate? Yeah, not too bad, buddy. Lots to talk about, eh? There's a couple of bits that we need to to discuss, yeah. Uh, second of all, Shona, how are you doing? As good as can be, I suppose, yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to the, the game, obviously, on Wednesday, now that we've got that over and done with yesterday. Exactly. I mean, this is just a Dundee preview. We're not really going to talk about that one. Nothing was happening there. So, uh, And finally, uh, Stevie, how are you doing, Mick? Mick ben? Good, mate. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, and yeah, looking forward to Wednesday, like Shona says. So. For sure. Uh, obviously, we had uh, you guys both doing a vlog uh, over at iBrooks, uh, Stevie and Shona, and we do encourage folks to check that out to get uh, some live reaction to the goals, which is very entertaining to see. Um, but we're here to kind of talk about the game in a bit more detail, uh, sort of discuss what uh, what happened, some of the stories coming out of it. Uh, it should be interesting. We've got a fair amount, as Kenny says, to discuss. Uh, just for the sake of posterity, the team was Butland in goal with Tav, Goldson, Suter and Sterling lining up in the defence. Lundstrom, Diamande and Lawrence in the midfield with Wright, Silva and Dessas up top. Kenny, I, I, I saw a lot of the discussion pre-game was around that lineup and um, how, although we had hopes for some of the players coming back in, uh, still starting Scott Wright, um, Cantwell, Batondo, Seema, players like that on the bench. For you, is that was that the right lineup? Do, do you think, I mean, obviously hindsight being what it is, do you think, um, you know, we we could have gone with something different? What were your, what were your kind of thoughts on it? I, th- I think Clement was quite uh, hampered by the fact that uh, Red Van Yilmaz didn't make it. I think that caused us a little bit of a problem in other areas because he's got to put Sterling in there. But no, I've got to be honest and say that when I seen the team, I, I think. But I don't. I don't want to sit and put words in everybody else's mouth. But I, I think it's at that point now with certain uh, team lineups when you see them. I, I don't know if you guys are the same, but you can just tell that doesn't really look right or you've got a concern or you've got a couple of concerns, you know, and hmm. uh, when I seen it, I wasn't 100% convinced, to be honest with you. But, you know, you go in, you know, full of optimism and it's still a, it's still a decent team there, but there's, there's certain players there that I was a little bit surprised by, put it that way. That's sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I th- and I think that's fair. Um, Shona, I mean, in terms of Celtic, they have pretty much now a full lineup uh, that they could call on. Cal McGregor was on the bench for them. Uh, we, I think we can really touch on his performance a little bit later on because he did eventually end up coming on and he did have an impact, although probably not the one he would have liked. Um, but th- this is, I, I think, uh, as Kenny's kind of alluding to, with, with the illness and with some of these players coming back, although it's on paper... A fully, like close enough to a fully fit squad, we we still have some of these players coming back from injury and uh, and in different stages of recovery as well. Yeah, I think the bench did look strong at the weekend. I think that was one thing that we definitely took out of it, that the bench did look strong. It was Cantwell for me. I think Cantwell is probably one of the most, most creative players. It was come on looking at the last Old Firm game and what happened there. I'm I'm, I'm not too sure. Was it surrounding, like Kenny says, on the, on the red band injury? I would more tend to Sway with that. I think um, you would obviously want this is the, the, the thing we've got with Sterling at the moment. I'm sure we'll go into it. But for me, we can't be putting him in all these different positions. He needs to be he needs to be in midfield. He can't be playing it at right wing and getting man in the match. He can't be playing at left back and get man in the match. So or best player in the game for me anyway for in, in, uh, for yesterday. So I think that was probably the main issue around the, the team selection was probably the fact that Red Fan didn't start um and having to put um uh, Sterling into into left back, but uh, look, I think for me as well, I think um, for what I thought from Clement was he wanted to go a bit more defensively in midfield, but that just did not work. I think what I've noticed from the past few games when Lawrence and Cantwell have played in there together, when Cantwell's in the midfield role and Cantwell plays the number 10, it's far more effective. I think then Lawrence gets more shots from outside the box. Cantwell's able to get on in and, in and around the box as well. He's able to link up, play better with Dessers as well um, and the guys out in the wing so I think that was probably the biggest one for me was putting Lawrence in the number 10 position I think for me mm. he has to stay in midfield 
and rotate with between Lundstrom and Sterling, depending on the game. And I think for me, it depends on then where do you fit Diamond in. I just felt yesterday there was far too much space in, in that, mid, that midfield um, between Diamond and Lundstrom. I said that many a times, especially when we look at the goals that we go back to. So regarding the lineup, I think probably the Cantwell was probably the biggest surprise. If you take um, Sterling and put him into left uh, left back, then your only really option on right wing was probably going to be Scott Wright or or Ross McCausland, and I don't think Ross McCausland was probably fully fit, so he was more yeah. than likely to go with Scott Wright. So I don't know how the rest of the guys think, but I think he was kind of left with that uh, to do that, Clement, because of uh, their advanced injury. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Um, Yilmaz, it, it was a, was a massive loss for me. Uh, I think he um, because of his absence, he kind of throws off the balance of the team. Um, Obviously, it, it does indicate that Borna Barisic is, uh, I think, highly unlikely to be hanging around. Um, certainly, the fact that he wasn't, you know, even considered as an option to come in, even even when uh, we started moving things around towards the end of the game, but the fact that he stayed firmly on the bench and didn't move, um, I think, is yeah, a pretty damning indication of where the manager sees him. Uh, Let's get to the game then, Stevie. We can talk about the really fun stuff now. Um, Rangers kick off, and within 21 seconds, we've conceded our first goal. Um, it's probably worth noting some of the conditions of the game. There was a, a heavy wind uh, going on, and it was blowing directly towards uh, uh, towards our goal as we as we started. But it's a shocking goal to lose. Um, I, I get that there's maybe a bit of bad luck in terms of to have trying to clear it and it deflects straight into into Jack Butland's goal but it's still really poor defensive work from us yeah <clears throat> we made an absolute complete arse of it to be quite honest but I'm going to get to that in one second just to go back to what the guys were saying previously about the selection I think the midfield lacked legs and energy Andrew Lundstrom is not fast Diamande is not fast and Tom Lawrence is no longer got the legs that, that he once had either and and that against a really energetic midfield in you know, O'Reilly, Hitati and Iwata just overran us completely. Now, there's been an issue with our midfield for several weeks or something not right about it. And I'm not kind of analytically minded to kind of understand what the difference is and what's going on in there. But even on the eye, there's something wrong with it. There's too much space. They aren't tracking. They aren't winning second balls. And I don't know if Diamandi is too similar to John Lundstrom, but there's an issue there. Maybe people can comment on it, and if I'm wrong, you know, please say, but it just doesn't feel right to me. And on that, I think that's where we caused ourselves a lot of problems in the in the first half. And even when we did get a break, or Lawrence did have a chance, or somebody that Lundstrom break in to kind of put a through ball, they were all awful. Our ball choice in that first half was absolutely terrible. And I think what happened, Andrew, is, and this brings us to the point that you made, when you see your captain, your tallies, man, 20 seconds making a mistake like that, I think it spooked absolutely everyone. And let's be completely honest, it was a complete brain fart from Tavernier. He stops, then realises, not only does he stop though, but two, the two centre half stop as well, which means that as Tav picks up the ball, an easy pass to his right would have been Goldson, who's not there. He maybe thinks, I can't put it back to Butland because of the wind, but he should have done it because Butland's sized himself up to get that pass back to his right foot he should have done any, he could have booted it out into the Copeland and taken a corner and just said look everyone settle down let's get regroup and go from there he did the only thing he shouldn't have done and not only did he do it he was completely casual about how he'd done it there was no real conviction in what he'd done and that caused him to get caught and closed down and that's the most frustrating thing because I spoke about this on the pod, I think, last week, and I said that it takes us time to recover from a knock and that's a, or a setback during the game, and that's exactly what we witnessed, Andrew. It was an appalling start, an absolute disgraceful start, but it's the nonsense that we've come to put up with, sadly, from the same actors in the same film in big games. And I'm not going to pile in. Look, 23 goals, 10 assists is, is miraculous. And by the way, at least he had the balls to recover in that second half. He scored a brilliant penalty and he recovers, but others aren't. And that's the issue. And it's the same people every time, disappointingly. So, so to get off to that start was, quite frankly, an absolute nonsense. Anyone that's seen the vlog will have seen Sean and I's face. It was, you know, trying to remain not swearing or anything else, you know, on the gantry. And yeah, it, it was 
It was just a, an absolute disaster to start, and it knocked the wind out of not only the stadium but also the players as well because they were stunned. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely fair. And yeah, as I said at the start, if you were scripting the uh, the worst possible way of starting an old firm, that's it, right? Um, as you say, Stevie, I mean, it looks like that affects us for, for the rest of that first half, quite frankly. Um, we started poorly. We continued to play poorly. Um, and, uh, yeah, then uh, we can see a penalty from, I think, a legitimate penalty. Um, Goldson's arms up. Later in law, it's a penalty. It strikes his elbow. Uh, it's disappointing to give that away. Um, it, it, is, it is a frustrating thing that um, you are apparently can't use your arms to jump, but that is the rule. Uh, players are well aware of it. It's been a running conversation in football in general uh, for this entire season. Uh, the players should be aware of it. Uh, it takes a deflection. It's unlucky again, but we we are 2 nil down uh, in an old firm at home. Uh, Kenny, I mean, it's, it's appalling, really, <laughs> to see. Yeah, it is. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves on, Andrew. That we were lucky it was only two at the time. There's, there's yep. just no getting away from it. It could have been three or four by that point already. Yep. Uh, we, we were certainly the, the, the worst I've seen is under under Clement. But that's as bad as I've seen uh, against them at Ibrox for a long, long time. I, mm-hmm. I thought we were horrific actually I thought we were absolutely yeah. dreadful every single player was off it it was it was strange to watch there wasn't a single player perhaps I'll give I'll give him his due I thought Dessers was actually one that was actually um working his backside off but there was a point just and I'm going to interject before we talk there there was a point where Dessers had started uh the press, and he actually turned around and looked, and mm-hmm. he just raised his hands because Silva's thirty yards away and Scott Wright's farther away, yeah. and he, he's just look. And it, it was just so reminiscent of the first game of the season. I don't know if you can remember that where Kamar Roof and him were shouting and bawling each other trying to sort out the press. We yeah. were totally wrong in that first half. We were all over the place, so. Yeah, it is a penalty. Uh, I've watched it back. I don't really know why Conor Goldson's arm is where it is. But, listen, things happen in football when it happens. But, uh, yeah, it was coming. That, that well, it, The goal was coming. It was clear as day that we were not on it. And they were. I've got to give yeah. them a little bit of credit. They were. They were, they were playing pretty well, but they didn't have to do much to carve us open all, you know, in that entire first half. Uh, and it was, uh, being honest, I, I, I was very concerned about what yeah. I was witnessing. I, I just couldn't believe it, Andrew. It was just so bad that you're like, well, what chance have you got? And oh, I've exactly. watched uh, the match day vlog from uh, Stevie and Shona. And, yep, the whole stadium was feeling the same. You're just looking at it, giving it, what is going on? And I got mm-hmm. that feeling from you two that, you, you know, you were looking at each other, giving it, what's happening here? Because it was kind of inexplicable how bad yeah. you can be in a game yeah. that's so important. So that was my kind of take on it. And as I said <laughs> to you guys earlier on, I was kind of concerned about coming on here because I'm still kind of speechless at that first half. I yeah. didn't really know what to make of that at all. Andrew, I'm sorry. It was just all. No, no, I mean... Uh, that's, that's completely fair. I, I think a lot of us are in the same boat, to be honest. See on, um, see on that, Andrew. I would just say those that have seen the vlog will actually see. Shona and I were quite unlucky yesterday, not only for the second goal but also the third that we actually were speaking just as Celtic scored both times, which we'll come to in a bit. But those that are talking about what Kenny was saying, we are actually talking twice. I think before the third day, uh, before the second goal, we're actually talking at the point the penalty's been given, and both of us are saying, we need to be really careful we don't concede again here because this is all over the place. They had a chance, Maeda goes in, Hitati shoots wide, you had the one that was tipped over the bar, one that went across yeah. the face of goal, and then you had the actual one that came to the penalty. So Kenny's right, we were well warned, and we're just 
in such a mess and such a funk everywhere. Even the basics of the amount of times we passed it to nobody yesterday and people were static was was so alarming. So just to kind of slightly interject, my apologies. That's good. Kenny's saying is, is completely right. And I'm sure everybody in the stadium would have been saying the same thing that at that point, Shona and I are actually speaking bang on. You can hear the tannoy go, there's a VAR check and a pair of us are like, well, we don't yeah. know what's <laughs> happened because it's the other side, but we're actually speaking as they get that and then as they score and we're both saying this is coming a mile away. Yeah, and I mean, I think Kenny talked about, you know, who he'd give a pass to in that first half. I'd include Butland in that. I think him as well, because he kept that to the point where we were still in competition, you know. Um, I believe the last time we actually came back and got something from a game where we were 2-0 down in an old firm was 1987. So I wasn't even alive when it happened, which is worrying. Um, That's off. (laughs) <laughs> I just want to do that for you, Kenny. Yeah, that's just that's a little treat for you, man. Um, but it is that thing, right? It, you know, you cannot even giving away the first goal is bad enough in an old firm to be two nil down and to look completely bereft of ideas as well that early on, like in that first half. It does not bode well. And so, I'm I'm watching the game with my dad at home uh, on Sky with its lovely unbiased uh, commentary, um, which we may discuss later on. Um, but, I mean, we're both sitting there at half time thinking, what are we going to do here? We, we have, like, this is, I mean, we know Phil Clement can change a team um, because we've seen it do it several times before this season. Um, but even so, he still claims that he is not magic, but there are still limits to that, aren't there? In terms of what we think is within the realms of the possible. Shona, we come back out in the second half and I think it was evident that we could see, you know, more more involvement, more desire from the team. The press was looking a lot better. And we do get to the stage where, despite Fabio Silva's efforts earlier in the game, in terms of trying to milk every single foul against him, which we, we could maybe discuss in terms of how necessary that was, he does go down in the Celtic penalty area and after a VAR check, um, a penalty is given. Now, Chris Sutton and Kelly Miller were very determined to tell me on Sky Sports commentary that this was never a penalty, uh, that he'd obviously blatantly dived. Now, if you're running and someone kicks you in the knee in the penalty box, my understanding is that's probably a penalty. But, I mean, I'm not an ex-professional footballer, so what do I know, right? Um Tav does step up and does put that away. And I mean, as as Stevie kind of said, you know, being able to come back and react that kind of way, show the balls to step up and take that penalty. That's really good to see. Um, but what how 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 how's the emotions doing at that at that point in the game where we've um looked so totally off of it and then suddenly we've got this lifeline again? I think the lifeline was crucial at that moment in time in the game. I think it was not long after we kicked off. So, uh, well, I think when was it around about the 50th minute, wasn't it? 55 minutes. 55 yeah. minutes. So, yeah, I think it was crucial for us to get back into that game. Did we deserve it at that moment in time? I think with, with the first half performance, probably not, but it gave us something. I think um, I think Dermot Gallagher and a few English referees have come out and said it was definitely a penalty. So yeah. you never know, there might be a conspiracy against some English refs coming up soon. So um, we'll need to watch out for that that space. Um, but no, I think it was, as you said, I think it, 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 it did go down a bit theatrical, but it's a penalty. Um, he yeah. clips him on the knee, he goes down. Um, obviously, the, the, the decision is then, does he get a red card or a second yellow? Um, but obviously because of the rules in the game say that if you made an attempt to go for the ball then it's it's not a second yellow as the IFAB rules state so um, look it was a lifeline I think Fabio Silva during the game was absolutely dreadful I think that first half performance was actually quite embarrassing um, the way he was rolling about the pitch yeah, yeah. I get that obviously Alistair Johnson's bumped into him but there's no need to start rolling about the pitch as if you've just been shot with a gun so um, but no uh, look I think uh, that, that was the, probably the one that gave us a bit of a belief I think Tavernier stepping up Absolutely smashing that that penalty into the was at the top left hand corner. So yeah, um, yeah, no, like, this down the middle nonsense. <laughs> so yeah, so no, um, look, that was probably the one crucial thing that gave us a bit of momentum carrying on from there. And I think we'll go on to to discuss the other goals, but I think at that at that moment it was crucial that we obviously scored that goal because I think then we had to get the fans after twenty four seconds and conceding the goal, and the guys putting on that pyro display and the Union Bears singing the atmosphere at the start of the game. Stevie was absolutely phenomenal wasn't it 
to for it to be killed within twenty four seconds to try and get the fans back on you because fans have just been they just booed them off the park at yeah. half time. So for them to respond like that, I think as well, what made a massive difference was Seema coming on. I think Seema for me possibly would could have been on your your other man in the match if it wasn't for Sterling. I think the two of them were probably your best players in the park um, uh, yesterday. So um, or obviously Ravi Matondo had a had an impact as well. But uh, look, I think Seema coming back onto that right hand side. I know he was playing left before he he, he went out, but that I thought Seema made a massive difference for us. I think his physicality, his pace. Um, his positioning as well, the fact that he can play like more or less like a second striker as well. So, but I'm sure we'll go into that. But yeah, the Tavernier goal for me, I think um, it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant penalty, and it was a penalty all day long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to stay with you, Shona, because um, we did score another goal, um, and we thought we'd uh, actually scored that second one a lot earlier. Uh, your your man, uh, Serial, uh, and and with an assist from uh, from Fabio as well. It, it it's it's frustrating because everything apart from the initial foul in that attacking build-up looks fine. He's not offside for once. He's um, he manages to put the ball away well. Um, frustrating as hell, right? As a striker to to score that goal, have that. I mean, it was an emotional release uh, and, a, and a celebration there, but then to have come back and say, actually, nah, sorry, Cyril. Yeah, and I think it was the first time actually we made a run right through the middle of the park. I think it was Fabio Silva that managed to retain the ball, and he yeah. he, drove, he drove forward, and it was a really good attacking uh, attacking um, um, attack from us. So, uh, but yeah, I think for me the the Desers goal, I'm absolutely gutted for him because I thought he actually had a decent game. I think he held the ball up well at times. I think he was also involved in the Matondo goal as well. So look, um, and, and obviously him and Cantwell, but yeah. Uh, look, Dexter's for me is always going to split people's opinions and I can understand that why he is. I think 11 of his 13 goals that he scored has, have been one-touch finishes. But he could have won it won it for us at the very end. He was just wide yeah. of the post and it was very much an, an instinct kind of reaction to how he took that goal. But I think in the first half he was kind of, he didn't really have much service and I think like that goal would have, been, would have done a lot for him in that, in that old firm yeah. game. But... For me, I'm not too sure why that goal was really disallowed. I know Stevie will come on to it in a wee minute. I'm sure he'll disagree with me here. But I know they're saying there, obviously, it's a foul that was that they've brought it back for. But for me, that's not a clear and obvious error. I think if, you, if you're if you're going to go back to all these decisions that are happening in the park, that happened 25, is it something like around about 25 seconds before the goal actually went in? Yep. So I think how far then do you start bringing um, play back for goals like this? I think it's just... it's. For me, there was another second phase of play when they managed to get the ball in the box and it came off their, I think it came off one of their players before it ricocheted towards Dessers. So, yeah. um, look, I think uh, that that's going to be a contentious decision. I'm sure there's other people that will probably disagree with me. Stevie. Um, but, yeah, uh, look, I think for me, I think he was very unlucky for that goal not to go in. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely fair. Uh, Stevie, I will come to you now. Um just to discuss the Seema goal, if we want to go back and we can talk about the Dessers goal, it wasn't absolutely. Um, but eventually, 86th minute, we managed to tie it up at 2-0. And we think, thank Christ, we've salvaged a point here, you know? So, a couple of things. At half time, with the vlog, I made the conscious decision that we weren't going to record vlog, it anymore. Vlog. No, it's vlog. definitely vlog. People have spoken. So I made the conscious decision that we weren't going to record it anymore. My decision, folks, was that I didn't want to become something that that opposition fans could just take the mickey out of. And I felt at half time we were completely down and out. As you said, it's been, you know, 1987 since we came back from 2-0. And I thought the way it was going, so I said to Shona, look, we're not going to record it. We'll just go and see what happens. And then they got the penalty. And I said, I'd said to Shona previously, if she remembers, I said one goal could change everything, but I don't hold much hope. Penalty comes and goes in, Shona says, blog it. So we did, we, we recorded it and stuff. And then Desser scored. And I never reacted. Shona, I'll, I'll confirm this. I didn't react. There was pandemonial, pandemonium about us, um, people in the gantry, you know, and I didn't react. And Alistair aired who sits to my right and Shona were both saying why 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 and I said this is going to be a foul my first impressions were it was a foul but we are sitting looking down on it from the gantry so we don't have sure. an angle on it so there's a couple of things to pick up on it's not a second phase it's still the same phase of, of attack and because we break directly into an attacking motion 
if we had played it about the back a wee bit and then attacked, it becomes a different phase. But it's all the same phase because Lawrence gets it or challenges for it. The ball goes loose and Silva immediately goes in the attack. So that's the same phase. It doesn't change a phase until the ball goes out of play or Celtic regain possession and control of the ball. That doesn't mean a deflection or an attempted clearance. And that's all they did when they touched it. So it's still the same phase, unfortunately for us. The argument about how far it should it goes back is negated by the fact that we immediately went on the attack and that's why it doesn't count. Shona raises a, a very valid point of is it a clear and obvious error when you're standing two yards away looking straight at it and you've deemed him to get a touch on the ball? I think that that's fair and that's an argument to have because effectively VAR is re-refereeing the game and you're not supposed to be in that position. However, Tom Lawrence doesn't get the ball. It is a foul. And he hits him at the same height as the penalty that we got, which was correctly given. Silva did throw himself down. Shona's absolutely right. And I will say, Shona claimed for it straight away. She said, he's caught him knee high. And she was absolutely spot on. I think I was still looking at the sky or something at the point, because I wasn't sure. And she was bang on with that. So... I don't think there's too much difference in height and contact-wise than the penalty decision and the foul. So if it had happened to us, I would have been screaming for it. So I'm going to play on the side of, I think, that that decision from VAR, as tough as it was, was correct. Going to the third goal, I was pleased with how we had responded. And I kept saying to Shona, kept saying, if we can get one back by 70, if we could score by 80, we could win this because 10, 15 minutes will be enough. Turns out 86 minutes they did score. It was a really well-worked goal because Sterling's came in on that short pass across from McGregor. He's played it to Matondo who tries to cut in. He's played it off. Turns out Cyril Desser's back as he turns, actually hits his back and the stroke of luck we get is stroke one. The second one, the stroke of luck we get is Seamus shot which was on target, is slightly nicked and it causes it to spin into the top corner. And I think at that point on the on the second half, we deserved that, Andrew, because I don't remember them creating that much in the second no. ch- half no. at all. There was a few well, back passes and things that were kind of dodgy. I might be caught up and I haven't seen the replay of the game full 90. I can't remember them creating much. So at 2-2 at that point, you're thinking, we've got 10 minutes. We've yeah. got 10 minutes, we've settled down and your wee bit in your head goes, we might win this, we've got a chance. And then within 20 seconds, what happens all over again? Yeah. So, yeah, um, and unfortunately for those that have, vo- have watched the vlog, they will see Shona and I talking about, and that's why the vlog for the second goal and the first goal and the goals that come after is me holding the camera because I've chucked the the stand and everything in my bag. I've given up. So that's why there's a difference in the kind of filming. So we're filming the second goal and Shona literally says, we can't give them space. Stop giving them space. <laughs> Celtic are, and I just go score. And at that point, it's cut. And we had to cut it, Shona, didn't we? Because the pair of us said some things after that. <laughs> some little words that were maybe not applicable, safe. For the, the, the we're trying game. not to get demonetized immediately um on youtube um, yet, so that i think yeah. it's fair a few sweary words <laughs> so no and it's justified right um you know we um you ever it, seen it, sorry you ever seen the bit in still game where both of them on on cue go f f s <laughs> well that's what we did yeah yeah as that one went in so apologies it's cut a wee bit short on that. Yeah, if we ever set up a Patreon or something, we'll give you like free uncut <laughs> <laughs> access to the sweary versions of the vlogs. Um, no, I mean, look, I, it's it's what the second, third time that you just have this thing that causes you to lose all hope. We um, we concede after twenty seconds. Uh, we think we've managed to tie it up, but it's it's chopped off. Um, now we've we've scored to bring ourselves level with a good ten minutes where we have been absolutely the dominant team in that second half. Like um 
I think Dowell's suicidal pass across our own box aside, um, we we never looked really under a lot of danger or under a lot of threat. Um, and then, yeah, either goes up the other end of the pitch and scores pretty much immediately. But, I mean, it's at this point where 3-2 down, It's it, I think there's a lot of muscle memory that's still there, which is the typical Celtic, they'll get a last-minute winner and win the game. Um, we've seen it far too many times, and it's been the narrative far too often, but there, there's something a little bit different about this Rangers team at the moment, because in the 93rd minute, Rabi Matondo, um, who... I think even a year ago, no one was expecting to do anything major at Rangers. Pops up and basically puts in an identical copy of the uh, goal he scored against Hibs last week. Kenny, um, uh, I believe you were at the game. Uh, how are the emotions doing at this stage? Bedlam. Um, it, listen, uh, it was one of those... How would you put this? It just, I, I don't know if you guys were the same, it just kind of went in slow motion. Yeah. And I think as soon as it hit, his, it left his boot. I think it, you could see it was going in. Um, it was just, again, one of those those experiences that you, you, you kind of, what Stevie just said about the second goal, it was exactly the same way I, I felt once, you know, I, I watched Serial Dessers. And he doesn't even celebrate. He's straight to the ball, the the go, the end of the net to get the ball and run up. And they think they can win this, um, and that's what I was thinking. I've got about five minutes left. Let's go and win it. Um, but listen, it was a fantastic goal. It was genuinely a lovely, lovely goal. In fact, I've seen Rangers have put out a, a little bit of footage from behind the. Yeah, uh, from behind Matondo, and it shows you how how great a, a a little move. He just checks, you know, inside, leaves the boy looking for a hot dog, and and just dinks it uh, right into the corner. It's a fantastic goal, and on the second half performance, I think we probably just about merited it because I can look back in that game and say, for all we were ridiculously poor in that first half. You've got to look at that from 55 minutes in to 95 minutes in. We had the ball in the net four times. Um, and I agree with Stevie. It, the, our disallowed goal is rightly disallowed, actually. It is a foul. Um, and it's a soft foul, but it's still a foul. Um, but we we weren't even particularly at the races in the second half, I didn't think. I don't know what you guys thought. I didn't think we were that great in the second half. Um, we were kind of huffing and puffing a little bit. Um, there was, I can't even remember now offhand what it was, but there was a little bit of chopping and changing, some subs coming on, and we just kind of lost our momentum a little bit, where shortly after we had uh, the Tavernier penalty, we'd lost our momentum a little bit. But there is something in this team that that Clement has instilled, that they, they have a will, they have a determination, and that that's what I'm, you know, if I'm looking for positives out of yesterday, that's what I'm going to take from it. Um, Matondo came on and did okay. I didn't think he was brilliant, but his goal was fantastic. But what I would say is that, you know, Shona mentioned Seema, but when Cantwell came on, there was a map difference on our right-hand side in terms of playing them because Greg Taylor was already terrified of Seema and Scales was getting bailed out by Carter Vickers time and again because Dessers was trying to target Scales skills um and Carter Vickers and him ended up having a bit of a tussle but you could see that Celtics left hand side at the back that's what we need to focus on in two or three weeks time that's where their weaknesses are they they are not good there and we have to get this right and this is where I was so frustrated when we started this pod talking about the team selection and I'm not going to stick the boot into any particular individual but our, our wings were not right yesterday. Our flanks weren't right. Uh, we, we had an imbalance in the first half because Sterling is is, is right-footed and Seema spent 45 minutes sitting in his arse. Uh, there was nothing happening there. It was just not happening there. And then with Scott Wright having a tussle with two of them, yeah. that it... And he's, he's he's not that type of player. Let's let's not kid ourselves on. He's not that type of player. Um, and I, I agree with Stevie again with the midfield. It's not quite right. There's something 
about Diamandi and Lundstrom that, that isn't quite clicking in over the last few weeks. And just very quickly to talk about, you know, the either. Uh, I'm not here to big anybody on that side up, but I'll tell you what, he terrorised Conor Goldson when he came on. Absolutely tortured him. And with all respect to him, that's Norwich's third choice striker, and he can't get a game for Norwich. So let's we, be let's be careful with the Norwich slander here, Kenny. All right. Let's yeah, I know, no, I know, mate. My, I know, my I know alumni. Norwich slander. Yeah, but, <laughs> but listen, it's it's. I, I'm I'm trying to be yeah. positive no, and I, realistic I, here. If we want I, to I get where we want to yeah. go, then I'm expecting our vice captain and our main centre back to deal with Norwich City's top choice striker. Yeah, a little sure. bit better than he did because he was tortured in that yeah. last twenty minutes. And really, I don't know what you guys thought, but I, I was like, I couldn't believe what I was watching at times. We have a huge issue over Conor Goldson at the moment, in that he has been spooked for weeks and weeks. And normally, Conor Goldson will hit a rock in one or two games and then come out of it really strong. He's he's not done that this time. And I feel that sometimes we give Conor Goldson a hard time overly in performances, but I thought he was utterly dreadful on Sunday. Not only that, his distribution of the ball, the amount of times he just overhit it to heart or kicked it out of the field. Positionally, he was completely all over the place. As I said, after 20 seconds, he needs to do more than that goal as, as well. He was caught flat-footed and stops. And listen, it's not his fault, but it's a symptomatic kind of visual representation of where he is at this moment in time that he's not where he, he should be and doing what he should be doing and I just think he's he's flapping, he looks he looks like he's ruffled Teal Bear, Motherwell ripped him apart that's Ida came on and, and ripped him apart and these guys are big guys and he's just not handling it at all well and we have got an issue, the fact that Connor Goldson got taken off with 3-4 minutes left at 3-3 three, three, if he's not injured, and he ran off by the way, he completely ran off, so I don't see where an injury is when he sprints off the field. If we've taken him off because the manager realises that he's having such a mare that he can't stay on for the last three or four minutes, and we're not safe enough, then that's a massive issue because that's very telling, and we need at some point to have a conversation about Conor Goldson in that is it this bad that we have to maybe think about Balogun just to shore things up at the moment. And then what implications does that have in the dressing room? Because Conor Goldson's massive in there. But if we're going to properly tackle the issues on this podcast, then Conor Goldson is one of them. James Tavernier had a horrific first half, but at least he had the balls to recover. And I go back to what I said before, that he takes an unbelievable penalty and his stats are what people will point to when he has a moment like yesterday, and those that don't like him will point to that moment and say that stats don't matter, and that's why he divides us so much. But Honor Goldson's performance yesterday didn't have an upside to it anywhere. He didn't do anything. He misses a guilt edge header at 1-0. I don't understand how somebody so big can miss so many opportunities from corners and set pieces for us, but doesn't doesn't bring his, his kind of physicality the way he defends into the opposition box. It's baffling for me. But he's been rocked for a long time, Andrew, probably since my off-season goal for Aberdeen that looked over him. He's He's been completely spooked, and I don't think he's recovered from that. I would defend Connor all the time if I could because I think that he does get a harder time off people because of the baggage for certain mistakes. And... I think that John Suter's had mistakes, I think Taps had mistakes. We've seen that, but you can't defend a level of performance like that. And by the way, he wasn't the only one. Fabio Silva's yeah. theatrics in the first half was absolutely disgraceful. And when players are telling you to get up, mm -hmm. our own players, that's a problem. Lundstrom told him to get up, didn't he? Several times he told him yeah. to get up. Yeah. And it was just, it was frustrating. And we don't need that. But, Andrew, to, to veer away from the negatives and the kind of final bit, I think, about the old firm from me is let's not forget that as much as we chucked it in that first half, they, as Kenny pointed out, when was the last time we scored three and a half, four and a half against them? I would have to go way back, probably to the 5-1 game under Avocat, 
to say yeah. that was the last time we got three because it was I think we were one nil at half time in that game. Then it went one each, and we went and won at five one. So that was the last time. So you're looking at twenty odd years before um, we we get to that that point again, which shows you the balls of the team to come back. Absolutely applaud them for that. The determination, the individual, the subs, everything kind of worked. Um, but from our point of view, Celtic aren't infallible the way that they make out, and they're you know pretty sure now that they've won the league. Sean and I sat through what we felt was two very very arrogantly positive press conferences where they more or less said that we'll take them back to Ibrox and do them. We don't play good football and they'll do this and they'll do that. And every single old form this game this year, Andrew, we've had a fighting chance in and we've missed a few chances. So I'm not writing us off of anything yet. I'm not prepared to because anything's possible when we go to Parkhead, but it's not if we keep having brain farts and we keep, do I dare say it, certain players keep shite in the bed when it comes to these these big matches. So, sorry if that's a wee bit pointed, but when you perform like that, people are going to say these things, and that's what the supporters are saying about Goldson, about Tavernier, about a few others, Scott Wright, John Lundstrom, whoever whoever you want to say. People are, are labelling that at them. So, if we want to be serious and discuss what people are saying, that's what they're saying. So, finally, for me, you know, it's a game of two halves, basically, yesterday, chucked in with as much grit and determination as we can show, as well as as much nonsense as we've shown at the same time as well. And we need to cut that out in the final seven games, but it, there's a long way to go yet before I'm ready to say that the towel's in and we've blown it or whatever. Let's get to the next game and see what it takes us. Can I just I say, it. before you crack on, Andrew, what Stevie said about you know them thinking... Where they're going to take us back there and, and do that. That is a, an utterly different game. It's and, I, and I, obviously it's a different game. But the point I would make is, if it was to sit there as the status quo is just now, we win our game in hand and we go there two points clear. That's a must win for them. It's an absolute must win for them. It's not a must win for us. And Philip Clement can sit and actually. Use that to our advantage as as a coach when he's setting his team up, because we don't need to go out and win that game. We're not the ones that are going to have to go and do anything over there. And I know this might sound stupid, but we don't. We actually don't. We can sit there and say, right, on you come then, because that is actually it. It will become a very European style of game. This where we're going to go away from home and try and get something out of that game. We're much more used to that than they are. And I'm not, I, I, I know I'm trying to be positive, but it is kind of true that it will become quite a European style game for us, I think, if we don't drop points before then. That's what I'm, I mean, I'm saying. And we're yeah, also better, more... I, would, I would say, sorry, Andrew, I would say we're also better set up for that, Kenny, with Seaman, uh-huh. Matondo, et cetera, back. So I would yeah, say yeah. that that's, I mean... I think them coming on to us is difficult because they proved they're very strong in that situation. But I think we showed yesterday, we've shown at Parkhead, even the chances created in the first game, we can hurt them. Mm-hmm. And they should have been out of sight yesterday. They should have been dead and buried and they let it slip. So they can say it's a great point for them. I absolutely get that 100% and puts them in the driving seat. Whatever narrative they want to spin, the simple fact of the matter is we were dead and buried. They should have been 3-4 up. They weren't. They blew it not once but twice, and that's the facts of it. They should have been looking at this league thinking we're almost home and hosed, but they haven't. And they are not, as I said, they're not infallible. Teams can hurt them, so it's going to be as much as we are not, and I don't think we are. But there's a long way to go from this to, for them to have been so arrogantly positive yesterday. Was, was quite an eye-opener. You had to be sitting there, and Shona can maybe speak about it as well, you had to be sitting there, and everybody in that room said, wow, you know, there's there's quite a a level there from them that of expectancy. We'll take them back to our place. This is what we wanted, etc. Okay, that's fine, but let's, let's see. That's it. Um, I got asked after the game, like, what do you even take out of this game um, as a whole? And for me, the biggest thing was Phil Clement's getting blood out of a stone here. Um, the the 
level of quality that we have throughout this squad, uh, I think pretty much in all areas of the pitch, is not where we need it to be. Um, we have a number of players, I think we've discussed previously, who we do not think are good enough. The the fact that Phil Clement has managed to take this team who under Michael Beale looked completely done, we looked like we were going to give up the league by, well, hell, in fact, we looked like we already had given up the league by the time he came in. To go from that to bring us to now, where if we do get that win against Dundee this Wednesday, then we are two points clear with basically the, the split fixtures plus another one to go. That's a phenomenal position to be in. Uh, the fact that Phil Clement has managed to get us to this stage um, with all of the things that are hamstringing him, uh, lack of money in the transfer window uh, in January and you know the, the players that he's got to work with, the fact that we are now in this position, I think speaks wonders to his managerial qualities, how well he's been able to get uh, performances, results out of this squad. Um, and I mean, to contrast his post-match comments with uh, with uh, what you and uh, with showing out what you and Stevie experienced, um, he was a lot more measured in that. Um, he had discussed beforehand that you know this game is not going to decide the title. It's it's a six pointer, but it is not a case of whoever wins this wins the league. And I still don't think it was the case. You know, a draw, I think, in that manner suits us a lot better than it does them. Because as Stevie says, we were in a position where we were dead and buried. We were done multiple times in that game. The fact that they were not able to close the deal, that I think speaks a lot to the the reserve of determination and grit that we do have within this team. Now, if we can just avoid giving opposition teams like a two-goal head start against us for the rest of the season, then I think we're we're looking pretty good. But Shona, I guess, you know, your overriding emotions at the end of that game and, and I even from that, how do you think we can, you know, still chart a course towards uh, doing something very special this season? Well, I think what you've got to do with the manager is you must have obviously got the team wrong to start with, but I think you've got to give credit for the subs that you did bring on because they made a massive impact. And I think obviously the changes then and to give that mentality, I think me and Steve have questioned us a few times about the mentality of the players. I think any under, not under any other manager, but I think under Beal, we would have never been able to come back from that game. I think uh, what Clamont has installed is a mentality thing where we have gone behind in previous games and we've come back from it. So I think what the players can take from that is we do have the capability to get at, at Celtic. The problem was, I feel, in the last few games, we have not got off to a good start. And it's the same thing. It's the same old story we keep talking about, conceding really, really, really sloppy goals as well recently. So I think what we need to do is we need to try and cut that out, even though we've got one of the best defensive records in the league. I still yeah. think we're conceding really, really poor goals, unnecessary goals as well, mainly down to our own fault and our, and our, and our own problems. So... I think you'll probably need to look at that. Do I think, obviously, like Stevie said, will he, will he drop goals in at this late in the stage in the season? I don't think so. I think you want you want to keep as much consistency there. I think the biggest problem for Clermont with this these group of players is you can only really I can only really judge these players at the end of the season and what we win at the end of the season because I think when Clermont came in there was players that he managed to get up to speed up to form and then all of a sudden got a really really bad injury. You talk about the likes of Sima, you talk about the likes of Cortez that made a massive impact. You've talked about Sterling, you talk about Campbell, now you've talked about Ridfan. All these players, which I think he has improved, they've, he's massively improved. These guys under him just seem to get injured. And unfortunately for us, well, or should I say fortunately for us, the other two that I think have obviously been better, apart from yesterday, was obviously Tav and Lundstrom. And they seem to be quite consistent. So I think with goals, like the goals, and very, very much a consistent player, he's never injured. I think that's probably why he will still remain in the in the starting lineup. So I think there's a few positives that you can take from yesterday. I think if you told me at 2 0 down we were going to come out with this with a draw, I would have bitten your hand off for it. Yeah. Was it the result that I wanted to go into? No. Was it a case of. We need to get that monkey off our back when we go into these old firm games. Absolutely. And I think, Kenny, I think, honestly, I think we need to do go to Celtic Park and win. Because uh, I do think if they do beat us, it, it's, it really is squeaky bum time. So, And they're not great. They've not got a great 
record at home this year. They have had quite a few poor results, so we should be looking at that ourselves and saying to them, let's get at them. But obviously, we can't get off to the same start that we did yesterday. So I do think there is positive to take out the game yesterday. I think Seema played well. You've got Matondo. I think you've got to go with these guys now. I think that's when Matondo's got, what is it, five goals and three assists. Seema obviously came back and got his goal. He was involved in it as well with the Dacers' goal. So... There's, obviously, it's positive that we're obviously going to have a strong bench coming up and we're going to have more of these players back. I think Dill, at times yesterday, I think um, apart from the goal, when he needs a goal, when he doesn't track back, it's at Matt O'Reilly that has all that space in the middle of the park. I actually thought he made a bit of a difference when he came on, just thought he was a bit more direct, same with Cantwell, more direct ways passing. So I think what the manager's got to take out yesterday is he clearly got the line-up wrong. I think that was a lot of that was down to the fact that Ridvan was injured. I think we'll hopefully have these guys back for the next old firm game. But look, we don't want to look at your head or ourselves for that. But yeah, I think we just need to get the guys like Sima, Ridvan, Matondo, these guys, getting more consistency in the game. I think Matondo now probably deserves now to get his... I know people will continue to say he's an impact player for me, but look, the, goal, the numbers and the goals he's getting are probably better than what Silva's contributing at this moment in time. So if, mm-hmm. I, was, um, if I was a manager, I'd be sticking in Matondo and Silva from the very start with Dessers up top, and I think that will actually help Dessers because... I think for the past few games, we're having Silva out in that left-hand side. I think what that restricts is the fact that Dessers has scored quite a lot of goals from that side of the pitch, especially from the left-hand side. And I think that's maybe one of the issues as to why maybe obviously Dessers and Silva have not really um, linked up particularly well in most games, I would say. I would say Matondo's probably a better threat to have coming down there with his pace. But look, at obviously this is just a matter of opinion. But uh, yeah, I think there is a few positives to take from yesterday question the mentality of these players and I think the mentality obviously we can't question that after coming back from uh, 2-0 down and obviously 3-2 to get a draw out of it but yeah I think um, for me you've got to be starting Matondo what a goal he scored and I think that's two goals now he scored in the past two games and I think he was involved as well I think it was was it Cantwell that managed to win the ball to start with wasn't it it was, it was mm-hmm. a loose ball from Cantwell Cantwell plays it out to Lundstrom and then obviously that sublime and it's the way he scores the goal, it's the curl, it's the dip, it's, it's everything that you've got it's right into the top corner. There's no chance the goalkeeper was getting it. So, yeah, for me, I think um, Clermont needs to look at his players not just now and pick the players that are on form and not just pick them because they're £30 million strikers and that's Fabio Silva. I think that's absolutely fair. Uh, Kenny, I want to talk the last word with you. Uh, I don't know why, just because. Um, <laughs> we uh, we had a bit of a set two after the match. Uh Campwell and Callum McGregor coming together. There was a handshake, then a bit of shoving, then the entire team got involved. What was notable for me in that was that Clermont was the one who came out to try and calm things down. Is it's I I think from a competitive nature, you want to see your players being a bit more aggressive uh, when when it does come to their their team. But I, I think. It's it's an interesting one in terms of oh we we hate to see that at football. Let's be honest, that kind of passion is why the old firm is one of the best derbies in the world. I, it was just um, it, I think for me it was disappointing to see Campwell being the one who got involved with that. Given that I don't think he had a particularly great game um, just this past Sunday, I think he he can be impactful, but I don't think he was in a position where he could um, start being arrogant when it came to 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 that game itself um but what was your take on that not a lot um in my day when they stuff that's that's what they used to call handbags in my <laughs> in my day that, that wouldn't have happened it would have been much much more uh <laughs> realistic than that but no look I, i'm i thought catmill was all right when he came on but but i'm going to say something that I genuinely believe we've won. I think it's now one in ten of these games. Do your talking on the pitch. Yeah. Let them mouth off for as much as they like because at this minute in time, whether we like it or not, that's what they're going to do because they are they are holding a candle over this fixture at this minute in time, and it's up to our, our players, our manager, us as a football club, to change that. And the only way you're going to do that. Is by doing your 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 talking on the football pitch. So if Callum McGregor is sitting sledging and he's mouthing off, listen, shake his hand, call him whatever you want under your breath, and walk away. 
that's the best way to deal with that. Don't, don't yeah. start shoving in it. I'm not criticising Todd Cantwell here in any way, by the way. He's entitled to do whatever he wants in that sense if somebody's, you know, giving him a hard time. But do your talking on the pitch, guys. It's yeah. that That's the bottom line. We, we have to start getting this fixture right because at this yeah. minute in time... Uh, in fact, I've seen a stat somewhere. This, just, this will be my last word on this. I've seen a, a, a very quick stat here. Of the last 24 goals we have lost against them, 18 of them have been at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm yeah. Sorry, in the first half, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've first got half. that mixed up. But 18 of them have been in the first half. And, and that's ridiculous. No wonder we're not winning these games. Genuinely. If we're not winning them, there's your reason. We're, we're, we're coming from behind all the time. Yeah. So do your talking on the pitch, guys. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, we obviously go to Dundee this Wednesday. Uh, I think by the time this actually gets out, it will be Tuesday, so a day away. Um, ideally, we know that the game's definitely getting played, but Dundee's pitch being what it is at the moment, there there obviously remain some question marks over that. I saw the state of the pitch uh, for their Motherwell game, and uh, it looked ridiculous. Um, but the game did manage to go ahead. The fact that Motherwell had to release a statement over it, saying they were concerned for the safety of their players, um, it, it's not a great situation to be in. My hope is that we can get this one played, get the three points, and put it behind us for as long as possible, um, because it's a disgrace of a pitch, um, and it's a shame we've got to go there. But go there we must. We must win that, those three points, and then uh, get through Ross County as well. We put ourselves in a very nice position um, going forward into the split. So we'll obviously be keeping you all up to date uh, here over here on Four Lads. Stevie, would you like to tell the people about the fantastic competition that we have running right now with our very favourite sponsors, Pi Sports? I don't know if they're actually our favourite sponsors. I just like them because they, you know they they give us pies. Yeah, listen, give us your entry for Pi of the Month. Um, the answer is probably going to be Michael Stewart. So if you all just enter and say Michael Stewart, we'll pick somebody and you'll get some pies. And it will stop me winning it because at the moment I'm kind of up there with Shona's revelation last week. <laughs> so, yeah, come and play. Put your messages or put your comments into YouTube, into whatever pod you listen to, or send us an email at fourlads at gmail.com or contact us on X or facebook and leave your message for us but yeah please enter and win it because i can't win my own pie so <laughs> come and come and play along and it'd be good like look the numbers and the people that are watching and the, the vlogs and kind of following the pods and all that are getting really good and we're into the thousands so we really appreciate it and this is our way of you know, Andrew talked about sponsors and stuff like that. We have an agreement with with Pi Sports, and we don't get anything or take anything out of that. We give back to people. So, you know, you win yourself a dozen pies or whatever. It might be good fun if you're having a party or kids over the weekend, whatever you want to do with them. So, come and join in. Play. Stop me from winning this because I'll never really hear the end of it. I haven't heard It'll the just end look of it on chat, so. It'll just look bad, Steve. Um, yeah. well, you can also use uh, code 4LADS uh, at checkout as well, even if you're not entering the competition, although we advise you to do so. You can get 12.5% off uh, if you use code 4LADS at checkout. So we encourage you to do that as well. I um, can highly recommend the mac and cheese pies. Just a cultural delicacy that doesn't make it down south here. Um, very excited by that. Um, so it's always a little treat when I manage to uh, acquire some of those. Um, but yeah, listen, folks, uh, this is probably the longest podcast we've ever done on this network. Um, but I think we've had a good discussion. We've obviously had plenty to talk about. We spent the appropriate amount of time talking about Dundee as well. And yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's always a pleasure talking to the three of you about Rangers, uh, good and bad positives and negative because uh well that's just life as a rangers fan for the most part isn't it uh so i'll thank all of you uh first of all kenny mate always appreciate talking to you yeah cheers andy uh shona a pleasure as always yeah thank you very much guys i think stevie in there in the corner there's rattling at the fact that it's over an hour i think maybe this way you can't really see it on his head with the amount of makeup that's on it so no way <laughs> well uh, <laughs> well uh, we'll move on to the Dund- dundee midweek yeah Yes, absolutely. And uh, Stevie, mate, always a pleasure. Yeah, we'll be vlogging from Dundee 
and also Ross County. Well, I will be showing us not involved now after that comment. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> my only kid, she's driving. Um, so yeah, come and join us on that. But just look, thanks, thanks everybody for your support. This is a wee bit of an extra longer episode. We do do them every now and then when it's relevant. It was a big game, so it is relevant. We hope you've stuck with us. Hope you've enjoyed it. And um, yeah, keep listening. It would be great if you could subscribe as well and share. And you know, I mean, who? Who doesn't want to see this head? You know what I mean? So come and watch and join in, etc. <laughs> and win some pies as well. Yeah. Tell friends, you know, get involved. It's going to be a good time. Uh, hopefully we'll have some exciting stuff to talk about towards the end of the season as well. So uh, let's let's hope the good times keep on rolling. Uh, listen, folks, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you, uh, to the listeners. It's been a pleasure talking to you, to the viewers. Hi. Um, so this is still relatively new for us, but uh, we're having a good time doing it. So we hope you're enjoying watching it. Um, yeah. Until we talk to you again, bye for now. Four Lads Bite Size Podcast is proud to be sponsored by Rhino Express and Clyde View Joinery, certified fire door installer and maintainer. Also in association with Rangers Pools, Zenith Coins and Alexander Campbell Interiors. Please share and follow the pod to help us grow. We hope you enjoyed the show.